being middle class. Um, I kind of want to start this conversation by going over um, some of the analysis in terms of Karl Marx and um, one of his terms he uses, which I think might be quite apt, is um, he, obviously you've got the bourgeoisie or the what he calls the ruling class and then the proletariat who are the, uh, the working class, the subject class. So the rulers and the ruled, if you will, in other words. Mm-hmm. But one of his other terms is he has a term he calls uh, the petit bourgeoisie or the kind of the people between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, uh, largely yeah. the sort of independent um, self-employed or shop owners and such. And he's kind of saw these people as though they were kind of, they were enough of a class of themselves. He saw them either falling down into the proletariat or rising up to join the bourgeoisie. So he actually believed society would um, further sort of split split down like that. Right. Well, um, I don't know. These days, it's it's. I mean, you you said it. It's it's more of just like this gray mass, right? Um. Mm. trying well, to, to to create the the sort of consumer base that is wide enough that you can sell anything to them right mm. and um it's interesting because earlier this week um aa released an article on his Substack all about um social conformity which is very um apt to what we're talking about because he says that um you know everybody we've got to consume the same mass-produced corporate films and right. culture and um we're all supposed to believe that we're individuals while we're doing it <laughs> right in the the individuality uh let's see if i can get through yeah it's it's almost five minutes i can bring up the loose now the individuality has been deterritorialized and re-territorialized as a product right mm, that, uh, absolutely and um, just to go back to uh mark Marx again i think it's worth sort of delving a little bit into the the etymology of the term so uh, as I was saying before we went live, so bourgeoisie, the etymology is from the French term bourg or town. So the bourgeoisie are essentially the merchants or the the sort of urban professional class and um, and the proletariat. Uh, this term actually goes back to um, ancient Rome because the proletariat or the proles in ancient Rome were the lowest um, social rank in the city. And where the term comes from is it means the term means children because the, to the, for the poorest of society, their only assets were their children, essentially, and that's where where it ah. comes from. Yeah, Interesting. And, yeah. So, um, and um, if you look at sort of Marxist um, view of history, um, he sees that there was once um, a feudal order with a ruling aristocracy that controlled the means of production. They were then overthrown and supplanted by the bourgeoisie. So again, so you have the the aristocracy supplanted by these um bourgeois types though one thing that i think that is lost on marxism again he obviously overly focuses on the material and um right. i think ignores a lot of the cultural roles of the aristocracy because you know the things such as noblesse oblige or their um mm-hmm. the, the, the role as, as as warriors and leaders certainly yeah uh th- there is something lost in the transition that the the boor, burger, uh, so to speak, didn't pick up, right? It just fell by the wayside. Um, and, and then it would be, excuse me, would be hammered by the Industrial Revolution and, and, and its consequences, uh, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, moving people en masse to, to these cities that, you know, in, in a sense, became almost like these Warhammer hive cities, uh in in the in the early 1900s or or late 1800s with you know people dying of illness left and right but the only work work to to get was you know slaving away in a factory for for pittance um because some some merchant needed to to produce you know textiles mm, exactly i mean my mind goes and to sell it to sell it to the edge of the world right Mm, exactly and um it's also interesting if you look at the middle class um as a ruling block because if we think of something like the french revolution you could almost say that the french revolution though we like to think of you know the um the urban sort of, sort of the commoners in the street um, marching on versailles we must remember that in most revolutions as outlined in the populist delusion are led by an elite the elite being the exactly. bourgeoisie so the bourgeoisie 
encouraged the communists to rise up against the French monarchy, the aristocracy and the clergy. Yes. And then, yes. if you will, stab the proletariat in the back by then making themselves the new ruling class and then <laughs> exploiting the proletariat. So Right. Which then sort of weirdly opened the way for some someone like Napoleon to just come in and say, yeah, I'm the emperor now. Um, and then, you know, weirdly, populist dilution again, everyone was okay with having a king in the form of Napoleon, even though, you know, it was essentially the same thing, right? Um, well, there's an idea. Um, so Imperium Press have released a book earlier this year called The, um, the Restoration of Political Science by, a, um, I think it's Karl Ludwig von Haller. Um, I've got it on my shelf, though I've not got around to reading it yet. But um, in that book, um, he basically argues, essentially, um, that with Napoleon, despite the French Revolution, you actually kind of have a... France kind of partially restored itself to the natural order of things, having yeah, one that's, that's what I'm strong... Saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah, one strong, um, you know, warrior leader over everyone, and not this, like, bourgeois republic. Yeah. Though, albeit though I still do feel even though all the trappings of it was you know weird and and republican you know the reality was as you said a, a return to tradition <laughs> really um well it's, in, it's interesting if you um if you want more information check out um, am streams on Napoleon especially because um Napoleon tried to have tried to really I think Napoleon basically saw himself as like a um like a like a modern day Charlemagne, basically. Um, if you look at a lot of the propaganda he used, and um, because he also revives the um, the bee, which was the symbol of the Merovingian, uh, which was the Frankish dynasty before the Carolingian. So mm. there are some interesting symbolism in in that, certainly. And um, what I want to talk talk about now is obviously I've got this image up here. It's called Idleness by John William Godwood. So I found this image and I was looking around. Um, um, like different terminology for the stream, and um, I picked it because it's got some interesting ideas in it. So you've got this, um, supposedly this middle class sort of relatively youngish woman, and she's sort of just leisurely playing with this um, cat. And um, I can't help but draw comparisons to you know, and you, you've got these like these modern like middle class professional women who are like single, childless, and just all they have is their their cat. <laughs> it just seems right. Like, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Well, it's it's certainly uh, sorry, certainly a, a strange problem um, to to face because uh, you have this class of of people, the women, um, who who have been, you know, ushered into the workforce in a in on a scale. Let me be clear. I mean, I'm not saying women didn't work. Women have always worked. Uh, in a sense, right? They're not just, they're just not joined the workforce in the same way as they did after their liberation and they didn't become a, a tax bracket, right? Until then, in the same way. But um, they've been forced into the sort of the thing that the men were uh, doing. And, you know, many of them believe that they, that was their right. But I think, well, you won't find any, anyone on, on our side of things who, who doesn't think I, I believe that, you know, that was a mistake. And, and looking at the women I know around me in my life, women that I care about, and I, I say the things I say out of love, it's hurting them and it's killing them uh, on the inside, right? And um, it's, well, uh, they're, they're, they're having problems that they shouldn't have just because they have to be exposed to things that men are better equipped to deal with in their everyday life. No, no, exactly. I think um, it'd be much better if people just, you know, stuck to what they were naturally de designed for, as it were. So, uh, and um, obviously going back to women working, yes, because if you go back, you know, you had the family unit, you know, material conditions back in the past weren't as, um, I guess, as affluent as they are now. So everybody had to chip well, in. And, and that's and help. the problem, right? You have, you have, you get all these problems as a side effect or a result of, of this move and and now you have to start because you can't say that was a mistake let's go back for some reason right um so instead you have to start treating this is the same thing that we talked about i was reminded of this because we talked about the incel stuff uh on our stream the, the long house by the way if anyone isn't <laughs> aware i run a weekly show um 
we were talking about incels and and it's kind of the same thing where you don't really want to create a society that creates these problems right that creates incels or creates you know burned out uh unmarried women uh but now you do and so you start treating the problem instead of trying to like make sure that you don't produce those people and then you know it, we're on the <laughs> the spiral right uh, no, no uh, absolutely and um i just want to address this um comment in the chat uh, so the biggest effect to splitting assets on divorce absolutely crushes upper middle class out of existence. Um, no, that's uh, well, certainly a pro I'll go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you first. <laughs> well, one thing I would say on this point is I'd actually say this is more of a problem for the, well, as I said, the petty bourgeoisie or the lower middle class because they've got less assets than the upper middle class because, again, I see, uh, again, the problem is we still think in these terms of upper middle and working or lower, but ultimately, the old upper class, the aristocracy, are, are dead and gone by this point. They've been completely replaced by the, the middle class. So all I see is, you know, you've just got two ranks of middle, the upper middle, and the and, and the lower middle. Well, and it's well, more the, the lower is, middle. What I would so yep. Yeah. Those people are gone in the sense that their their station in society is gone, right? But I wouldn't necessarily say that their wealth bracket is gone. I think there's a lot of them. The problem is that most of them these days are probably, you know, boomers who are close to or, or have already retired, right? Mm, if you're just nice. looking at the, the assets, right? Mm. Um, regarding the uh, divorce, I think, I mean, yes, it does cause problems for the upper middle class. I think you're right in saying that it's worse for the lower middle class, but I'd say that, you know, it's not, it's not the... Uh, it's not the asset splitting, it's the no-fault divorce becoming a thing, right? Because everyone is making mistakes and getting into marriages they shouldn't get into, which then results in divorce, which then results in an unstable family unit, both, you know, uh, spiritually and economically. Um, no, I, I suppose that's fair. And um, actually, one other thing I want to say, talking about the idea of elimination of the old aristocracy, or upper classes, um, I'll never forget, there was a tweet I saw once that was shared by a raw egg nationalist, and um, and it's about how in London, um, these like the descendant of the Duke of Wellington and the descendant of Napoleon are both like, this is actually true, are like rival um, like stockbrokers in like investment banks in London. And he was saying, look at the, the absolute decline of these, the, these, you know, these guys' ancestors were like generals on the field of battle. Yeah, and yeah. Descendants are now reduced to like bean counting on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, yeah. So it's what's well, the closest like, thing the modern world has to offer them, right? No, exactly. You know, there's no more no more temple glory. It's just you know bean counting, as Carlisle <laughs> puts it. Oh yeah. 